Welcome to the Exam Study Expert Podcast, helping you ace your exams at school and university through the psychology of high performance and the science of studying smarter, not harder. It's my pleasure to introduce your host, the Cambridge-trained memory psychologist and exam success coach, William Wadsworth. Hello and welcome to the Exam Study Expert podcast and to the final instalment of this mini-series on neurodiversity and studying. Following previous episodes covering dyslexia and ADHD, we are today talking about autism with the help of Brian Irvin, who's had years of experience uh, dealing with autism and students with autism at all levels of education, uh, from from being a teacher of younger children through to the school teacher of older teenagers, and more recently as a specialist mentor for many years uh, for students with autism at university level, going on to study this and research this as part of his PhD. For today, I've also handed over the hosting reins uh, for the first time here on the podcast uh, to my exam study expert colleague, Dr. Alex Hibble. Alex won't be a stranger to regular listeners here on the podcast. She's joined me uh, throughout the Neurodiversity miniseries over the past couple of weeks and also popped up in several episodes earlier in the year on things like the social side of studying and good brain health habits. Alex, if you haven't met her before, is our lead school speaker for the work we do in schools to help students with their study skills and is also now our lead coach uh, for study skills and exam prep coaching uh, for private clients uh, at school and university age. I'm focusing on older learners typically taking exams as part of their careers. You will hear from me again at the end of today's episode with my top takeaways from the interview. Uh, But just before I hand over to Alex and Brian for a really interesting conversation uh, they've had on this, I just wanted to share a couple of my reflections on some of the themes that have been coming up time and again across this uh, whole little series on neurodivergence. uh, So you can listen out for those themes when they come up in this conversation. The first one is what's good for neurodivergent students is so often, not always, definitely not always, but quite often helpful advice for everyone. And that was a massive theme in Eric's podcast on ADHD uh, last week, for example, uh, and it also rears its head again today. Secondly, there's awful, there's understandably a lot of focus on the challenges that uh, things like dyslexia, ADHD, autism, uh, and all the other forms of neurodivergence bring. And I do not for a moment want to downplay the very real and very substantial struggles uh, that many individuals with these conditions face in both their education and in their life and careers generally. But it's also true that there's a flip side. Each of these conditions is about your brain working in a slightly different way. That's the whole point of the term neurodivergence, after all. And alongside the challenges, uh, it can often also bring unique strengths. And I think it's worth celebrating those strengths where we can, because it can often lead, by understanding those strengths, it can often lead to the solutions to overcoming, mitigating, finding your way around uh, the things that you do find difficult. To find difficult. And then thirdly, we're all different uh, and understanding that is so often the key to success. Brian has some fantastic tips, uh, practical tips for us on that point in this episode. So without further ado, I'll hand you over to Alex, your host for today. And let's start by welcoming Brian into the guest seat for this week. Brian, welcome to the show. Real pleasure to be here. My name's Brian Irvin. I've just finished a PhD in specialist autism mentoring, having spent a decade working with autistic students in higher education. I currently, I work as a researcher at University College London's Cray, the Centre for Research in Autism Education. I also work on their Superior Perceptual Capacity in Autism project. Before all this, uh, I was a SEND inclusion unit primary school teacher. Last century, I was head of RE and philosophy in a secondary modern school. I did my PGCE at Oxford. I keep bees. It's a great hobby. It keeps everybody else away. I also, I think I have to disclose my own neurodivergence. I am an aphant. I have a brain with no pictures. Something that I'm going to be talking about a lot today is choosing those strategies which are good for us and making sure the strategies which don't fit with our own way that our own minds work, how to discard them with confidence. I love that idea of discarding with confidence. We speak to students every day and there are so many different techniques for revising, but also for focusing in classrooms. 
and knowing I am the expert on me out of this overwhelming sea of options, which ones can I choose and which ones can actually I say that one doesn't work for me. It's that idea of you are the expert on you all the way through this, whatever I say, whatever you say, whoever's listening, walk away thinking, yeah, actually, you're the expert on you. If what we've said doesn't chime with you, that's OK. I thought we could start talking a little bit about the research you do now. I look at the superior perceptual of capacity of autism. It may be one way of describing what autism is. I, I try to take it slow when describing what autism is because it's so easy to get wrong and to get muddled up. The superior perceptual of capacity is one way of thinking about it. We found in the labs that autistic people can hear more and see more and sense more. There's more information going in at any one moment. This has upsides. It allows you to see more beauty. It allows you to feel things more deeply. The downside is you can also see more ugliness. You can see more strife. You can see more chaos. You can feel the, the, the world creating sensations of, well, overwhelming sensations. Superior perceptual capacity is a lovely, lovely way of thinking about what autism is. I think it has to be held alongside a couple of other ideas, like a monotropism. So it could be not just the information going in. It could be that autism is also a mind designed for doing one thing brilliantly at one time. So I also work with what's called the double empathy problem. So this was an idea about autism by Damien Milton. He talks about the fact that whether it is the way that the brain is made, whether there's a difference in that, whether it's a difference in perceptual capacity about stuff coming in, it gives you a different perceptual reality. So autistic people see the world differently, they think about the world differently, which means that the majority can misunderstand them, just as they can misunderstand the majority. The internal life, the, the way that we create our own realities is different. And this double empathy problem causes so many issues, so, so many mistakes to happen. The minority group can sometimes internalise an awful lot of that. So actually, in the context of exams, you may be being told stuff at school that doesn't work for you. You may be told stuff at university that doesn't work for you because you see the world differently. That can really cause uh, an awful lot of issues. So however your, your neurodiversity manifests, actually do things your own way. Try not to judge other people for the way that they do stuff as well. We're all different. When I first came across the phrase double empathy problem, I found it a little difficult to understand. The easiest way I've had it explained to me is that I just speak a slightly different language. And I found that so helpful because, you know, I really struggled with learning languages at school. So if I'd gone to France and tried to speak my not so good GCSE level French, of course, people would have misunderstood me. But it wasn't that either of us had ill intentions. It was just we weren't quite communicating in the most effective way. And so I think that idea of speaking a different language can sometimes be quite a, a useful way of you know, conceptualizing that. The other thing we have to chuck into the, the mix is what we call the heterogeneity of the autistic population. Or simply, autistic people are very different from each other. But the amount of difference within the autistic population can be huge. So we, we uh, sometimes use the phrase, um, when you've met one autistic person, you've met one autistic person. And that kind of specificity, that this is a person who has their own way of seeing the view, is a really important lens about how we think about autism and how we can think about autism at exams. So there's a communication difference. There is some findings that autistic people get on really well with autistic people because you see the world in the same kind of way. And so the communication issues kind of evaporate. Autistic people have an attention to nuance, seeing the details in things, which is a brilliant way of approaching the world. There is maybe a whole um, set of, of levers about intense and focused interest, passions for things, finding things deeply, deeply interesting and having a tunnel of, of flow, being able to navigate one idea onto the other idea. And, and particularly when it's something that you're really, really interested in. That's an amazing way of looking at it. For some, there's a love of routine and a love of rules, particularly if you are very sensitive to your sensory world. A routine can stop surprises because surprises can be horrible. Rules can keep all the, the sort of noise and chaos at bay. It allows smooth functioning. But also, the, the lovely thing about a routine is once you've got it w working really well, you have brilliant days. And maybe if you, <clears throat> shall I say, parents come in and crush your routine or tutors come in to crush your routine, 
that's not helpful because it's stopping you having your brilliant day. That was a very brief overview of autism. There's so much more out there. The heterogeneity means that actually your individual results may vary. Just enjoy and and learn your own flavour of autism. That idea of seeing more beauty in the world. There's the phrase sensory overload, probably describing something very similar, but a more negative flavour to it. So if we're thinking about this in terms of classrooms, what could students do in that setting? Comfort is really, really important. In the classroom itself, particularly in higher education, we talk about universal design for learning, actually making sure that everyone can access all of our learning spaces and comfort is part of that. So that there is that whole bit about uh, you know, being able to create our sensory worlds. I always been a fan of taking in a cushion into lectures. Make sure you can sit where you need to sit. For some autistic people, being near an exit is really useful just in case of anxiety. For some autistic people, seeing people going backwards and forwards in front of the door, it, it's that perception of movement that suddenly derails a thought. Actually finding a place within the space is useful. In classrooms, I think there also has to be a bit about getting those those wonderful flows going. So actually, if you have been set to do a piece of work within a classroom, being able to just get on with it rather than having someone stop you every 15 minutes or so to check on you. Please don't do that. If you're at university, talk to your disability office. Get on to your learning plan. If you have anything that you're a little worried about addressing with your tutor, like wearing headphones, like being able to stretch out if if you've got posture problems as well. If you are still at school, you may not have so much of control. This comes back to the you are the expert on you bit. If you are the expert on you, you should be able to go to your teachers and say, actually, I it's just a bit of a mess in your class. Would you mind tidying up the walls a bit? You might have to have a chat with a trusted adult a parent, a carer, and actually say to them, would you mind coming in with me at 3.30 and I need to talk to Mr. Irving? And actually, my old teacher self would have loved that. And sometimes if you have a really good teacher in one class, maybe they'll have your back when you take that across to the next class. I love that idea of helping a trusted adult, just sort of scaffold that process. And especially that idea of if you have a teacher And that class actually is going fantastically. That teacher will know how to talk to the other teachers in the language that teachers understand. It's difficult sometimes to put your finger on what isn't working, but looking up a list of things that other students have said, just saying, oh, I've ticked off some things that might help. Would it be possible to try some of these? And then seeing what happens. You are growing into your own expertise. You actually have to try a few things and you might get a few of these things wrong as you go. Being wrong is a very interesting thing, particularly if you come from a minority neurotype. We may talk about how the the heterogeneity of the autistic population, how different autistic people are from each other, but actually still getting together in groups, talking with people who know about autism, talking with autistic people in particular, maybe reading their books, following them on Twitter, seeing how they navigate the world is amazing. One of the benefits of COVID was that people got so much more used to forming communities online. Maybe you're at a small school, maybe you don't know any other autistic students, but like you said, hop on Twitter, find a community. Hashtag actually autistic is a a good one on Twitter, where actually autistic people answer the question. So talk about anxiety. Uh, A lot of autistic people stim. Um, They might flap their hands, they might stamp their feet, they might want to make noises within themselves. And this is a way of checking in with your body to know you're still there. It is one of the most amazing ways of modulating your own mood for joy and for terror. And in exams, you can get a bit of both. When you hit that wonderful question that you know you're prepared for, you want to be able to let out that sound of joy, that that movement of joy. Doing this in an exam room in silence with 500 other people, it can cause a lot of shame and worry, which then builds on top of the anxiety. If you've got a room by yourself, because your examiners, the invigilator, will know about uh, this, feel free to stim. If you want to talk about it with your invigilator before you you start, please do. Uh, With students in the past, we've sort of actually written letters to invigilators saying, actually, when I'm excited, when I'm deep in thought, I rock. And actually putting it out there, not everyone will want to. If you don't want to share that with an absolute stranger, that's really understandable. 
But maybe this is a stranger that will understand and you can do that in that confidence of that exam room. Also, clarifying exam arrangements, uh, if you do have a room by yourself or, or if you've got a room with just uh, a few other people in, it might be in a different place. So actually going with your mentor to go and see what these rooms would be like. Everything you're saying for university also applies at school. There will be a Senko mentor. There is someone who is there for you. And the more you know about what's going to happen on the day, the better. You might not know what you want to ask for. There's lots of different options for exam accommodations. There are a list of sort of very standard accommodations that schools expect you might ask for, like extra time or rest breaks or being in a room on your own. But there's also the flexibility. You can ask for things that maybe a student in your school hasn't asked for before, such as a room is getting too much sunlight or it's going to be too hot. These are all things where if you know that might be a problem for you, you can ask. It is, it's creating the spaces that you know will work for you and hopefully having someone to advocate for you. And it's that long term thing, which is why it's useful at higher education to access your mentor should you have one. It's someone you can do this with throughout the time. Talking early about exam arrangements, ideally at the start of the year, working out what can be put in place for you and having those discussions about arrangements you might not even know that can be put in place for you. Any final extra tips for exam accommodations that students might not have thought of using but could be really helpful? Noise cancelling headphones. Um, if, if you could have them attached to a Bluetooth outside the room and somebody feeding you answers, well, that's an issue. But actually, if it's a noise cancelling headphone that allows you to work, then that's a real benefit. So you might have to talk to disability officers and exam officers a long time in advance for that kind of thing and try to navigate it through. Um, actually, I highly recommend loops. Um, loops are a passive ear plug and they've got a little bit of metal that comes out in a little circle so you can still get them tuned. So you can get loops that you can actually stick in during a lecture where you can hear voices, but you can't hear the plumbing. Really, really useful. So, so, so tuned ear, ear, ear plugs. Those sound absolutely fantastic. Thinking about revision, what would you recommend specifically for autistic students? I'm a great believer that the, the best way to revise is to learn things right the first time. The problem with that is there is an illusion in knowing. Uh, and it's trying to find out what you've got right and what you've got wrong. Interesting, if you do past papers, it also improves your recall of the things that, that weren't on the past paper. But isn't that great? The fact that actually doing a past paper improves general recall rather than just the specific recall of the paper. Get, get your past papers, download them just so you've got them right at the beginning. Because getting things wrong is how we learn. Unfortunately, and I think I mentioned this earlier, that clicks into self-esteem and autism. If you've been told you're wrong so often, getting things wrong can really hurt. I think it's a framing thing. Being told you're wrong, oh, horrible, don't like it. But doing a practice paper, turning up for that pop quiz at the start of class, knowing ahead of time that you might get things wrong, and that's okay. You've sort of volunteered. You've put yourself in that space to get things wrong. But the point of getting it wrong is so you know what you don't know. Another fantastic resource that the exam boards provide is specifications. And these can be pretty granular. And it goes into a lot of depth about every possible area of the course. And that can be a really great one, just choosing what you know and what you don't know. But it can be a bit overwhelming. With that one, I have to give a heads up. Sometimes detail is your friend. Sometimes detail is your enemy. Fortunately, a lot of autistic students can apply for extra time in an exam which means you can give all the detail to be properly understood. Sometimes you want to give the long, detailed answer because you want to be deeply understood for a one-mark question. Actually, it's going to take a little bit more time. Just beware of dropping yourself in too much detail and know that you've got your own, it might need an external clock. And sometimes just being in a room by yourself, you, the, the internal examiner can, can just say, um, yeah, you should be moving on to question two now just to get to, to allow that process to happen. Unfortunately, that also can get in the way of those wonderful flowy tunnels that I started talking on about. I love this idea of flowy tunnels of focus being almost like a superpower for students with autism, having these stretches of time with deep focus. But I agree, it can be very distracting when you have to keep moving on between questions. Something that you could do 
is actually stack up the questions, the longer answer questions. So you can really get into those flowy tunnels of focus and do those longer answer questions and then stack the much shorter answer questions, either do those at the start, do those at the end. Every student is unique. You'll have different preferences. But if you know that you're a student who can get into those flowy tunnels of focus and do those long stretches, then stacking together those longer answers can be a great way of using that superpower to benefit you. Now, the problem happens when you've got two exams in a day or maybe six exams in a week, which seem to be different subjects and bouncing around. Uh, when we started, I talked about monotropism, the doing the one thing at the time really well. So a couple of months beforehand, you prepare for doing one thing at a time. You look to see whether you can create, I sometimes call it a, a gear change pack. You, you do your revision for the first exam in the morning, but also you've a couple of days beforehand, you've done the revision for the next exam and you've created just a few cards that allow you to refocus and bring that monotropic drive of brilliance to that afternoon exam. So across your 10 years as a mentor for autistic students at university, would you say that you've noticed any patterns in the types of exam anxiety that students experience? Uh, I've, I've been working with maybe two greater groups of autistic students. I have some autistic students who get really bad exam anxiety. It builds up. It's terrible. I also have a bunch of autistic students who tell me that every day is anxiety. Having to live in the neuronormative world with the sensory stuff that comes your way causes an awful lot of anxiety, which weirdly, by the time they get to their late teens, early 20s, makes them quite good at coping with big anxiety. So actually, when an exam comes along, business as usual, just more anxiety. And so actually, we have quite a few autistic students who do quite well in exams because their coping strategies have been well developed over time. Just with the warning, just because a coping strategy worked last year doesn't mean it'd be working quite as well this year. You do have to refresh them and not get entrenched. Absolutely. Every year we'll have different challenges depending on the subjects you're doing, the types of examination you're doing, whether they're long answer, multiple choice, practical, coursework based. And it's important to update or modify your revision strategies or your coping strategies to reflect those differences. So you mentioned that sensory overload can be a symptom that autistic students deal with. When it comes to revising, is there anything you can recommend in terms of the environment that students should revise or study in? You have to go and say, right, I've got to do independent work. Uh, where am I going to work best? My desk in my university dorm. Uh, is this a good study space for me? Oh, or, or should I be over on the day bed where it's a bit more comfortable? Oh, if you ever revise in your bed, if you've just got a small room, one head goes up one way for sleeping, turn around, go the other way for revising. So that actually your physicality switches across. It's what you can do with the space. It's learning how to use libraries well, how to turn up and say, well, this is my space. And libraries, luckily, aren't the scarily hushed places. There's now a little hubbub that goes on, but there'll also be really quiet places. You find what works for you. You work out how to look at your own revision schedules, about how, to, how you revisit past material. You learn to love your own notes or hate them. There has to be something about learning to love the way that you approach your own exams. Learning to love your last minute panic. There, there is something about that of exams as, as, as you just arrive and you get that burst of adrenaline. If you like that sort of thing, I, I think they can be a little bit addictive. I have to say, when I'm speaking to students, I sometimes get a little envious. I did love that adrenaline hype that whoa of anxiety just before exams, but also getting addicted to that feeling of walking out of the exam hall and thinking, oh yeah, I showed them, like I did a great job. That can sometimes be a good motivator, knowing that there's a joy that you can get as well as the whoa, panic. Now into that, I will chuck one maybe. The joy of walking out of an exam that you have completely failed to revise for and still done quite well it's a strange joy and it can cause you to repeat it all over again. Don't do it. It might work once. It might never work again. 
And if you learn stuff and if you love things to start with, if you have a passion for learning, you may continue until you're well into your undergraduate before you realise you actually have to do some work. But the work can be fun. Occasionally, there are groups of students who, if they are told that they have to revise, will not do it because they need to show their own advocacy. So it's actually working out yourself what it is you love to do and actually using your own internal motivation, not having it pushed upon you by a parent telling you to do stuff or a lecturer. So it's actually trying to bring together all those things in that internal motivation, that internal joy. What One last thing, which I haven't covered in any of this, is turn up. Seriously, uh, it may be worrying, it may be anxiety provoking, but a exam done is better than no exams done. We talk about sort of more granular detail inside the exam. If you have a question and you know, your mind is completely blank, you don't know. Anything. It's always better to write a little bit of something. A question done, even if it's not done well, is better than a question left empty. So it applies to the exam, it applies to the question. Yeah, deeply. Just because you've had these accommodations of, I'm taking along my noise cancelling headphones, I'm in this room on my own, I have all this extra time, I have these rest breaks, don't feel like you have to use them. If you think you've finished the paper, and you're happy, you've checked through it, you can leave. Yeah. Uh, and actually, that's where small rooms are good. Actually, if you need a walk and return, as long as it's not outside the room, you can have that little wander around the room in a good stretch. But actually, if you're done, and you know you're done, then you are done. How cool is that? Head held high. Yeah, I think that's a lovely image to leave on as well. Sort of head held high, walking out, feeling that joy, that sort of satisfaction of a job well done can be really powerful. Brilliant. Alex, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you about these things. It is. It's real lovely. It's fantastic. And all of those years of experience with autistic students and also that research, you know, your passion really shines through. And it's been such a lovely way to start the day by talking about something you're so excited about and so knowledgeable about. Yeah. What a great conversation. Thank you so much to our guest this week, Brian Irvin, as well as our guest host this week, Dr. Alex Hibble. I wanted to close out this episode with some of my top takeaways. I've got five top takeaways that I particularly uh, wanted to uh, highlight from that conversation that, that particularly struck me. So in at number one, uh, make sure your teachers, tutors, professors understand and accommodate, uh, for example, seating preferences, headphones, a cushion. Number two, when it comes to exam taking, a particularly useful accommodation might be considering a room by yourself, uh, so you're more free to express without shame, as Brian was saying, as well as considering things like noise cancelling headphones or loops. Uh, if you'd like to pick up yourself a pair of loops, check out the link in the show notes. We've linked those up in the show notes uh, if you'd like to buy a pair for yourself. Third, and this is one of those great examples of what's true for uh, students with no diversity is true for everybody, getting things wrong is how we learn. Uh, this is one of the uh, things that we say time and time again in our, our own teaching work, our own study skills and exam preparation teaching work with private clients and in, and in schools and universities. Getting things wrong when you're doing that retrieval practice, when you're testing yourself, getting things wrong is part of the process. Don't be put off by wrong answers. That is part of the training. That is part of how how we learn, as Brian so very rightly put. Number four, think about your exam technique. For example, the order in which you tackle a paper, which kinds of questions you do first and the order you do it in. Uh, there was a nice example uh, that Alex and Brian were talking about in this conversation today. Uh, and we have other thoughts uh, on other sorts of circumstances and where this principle comes into play as part of our book, Outsmart Your Exams, which is also linked in the show notes. And then fifth and finally, what's worked before might not necessarily work again. So do make sure you spend appropriate time uh, refreshing your strategies accordingly, making sure they're as good as they need to be. Well, look, I hope you've enjoyed this episode and this little mini series on neurodiversity more generally. Uh, it's been one of the most requested topics uh, over the past year or so. So we're really excited to bring this to you. And I hope um, it's brought a new level of understanding for those of you uh, that don't have these conditions uh, to, to, to what sort of your friends or relatives uh, might be experiencing. Uh, and for those of you that do have one of these conditions, then I hope you've been able to pick up some practical tips uh, that might help make life that much easier for you in your studies as a result. Thank you so much, as always, for listening today. It's been such a pleasure to have your company and we'll see you again soon. Thanks again and wishing you every success, as always, in your studies. 
If you've got exams coming up, you can now get all of William's favourite tips and tricks to save you time and get you higher grades, all in one handy cheat sheet. Grab your copy at examstudyexpert.com slash free tips. Thanks again for listening and see you soon.